<clears throat> okay. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. It's uh, six o'clock. I think we can get started. Welcome to Race and the Criminal Justice System Forum Series. And today we are going to do the final, the last one, where do we go from here, affecting societal change. I'm Dong Isbister, um, Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at UW Platteville. I'm going to moderate today's forum. Okay, so this is the overview. Um, first, we're going to have uh, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, our invited speaker from the Department of History at The Ohio State University, and uh, he will talk about the importance of Black youth activism. And uh, then we are going to have prior forum speakers who will join Dr. Jeffries to discuss opportunities, uh, spaces, and, um, and strategies for collective efforts to respond to racial uh, injustice and instigate societal or social change at the mi macro and the micro levels. Okay, I, I see uh, we still have uh, people um, coming uh, joining us. Okay, so I just want to uh, pause uh, the, for, uh, the PowerPoint slides for now. And uh, so here we have some guidelines uh, for Q&A. And um, so this forum will be recorded and due to the large number of participants, questions should be asked in the chat function on Zoom directed to the host. Please ask questions rather state comments. Depending on time constraints, it may not be possible for all questions to be addressed. Questions that are clearly written, open ended and directly connected to the speaker's presentations have a higher likelihood of being selected. Please identify yourself in the question. If you are a student, please write your name, academic year, and major. If you are a community member, please provide your location and position if relevant and available. Please remember that you can follow up with Dr. Uh, Travis Nelson, uh, Chair of Criminal Justice and uh, Social Science Sciences. And here are some uh, expectations for the forum. It is an expectation in this space that all questions, thoughts, and ideas will be expressed with civility and respect. We should listen with curiosity and the willingness to learn. The goal for all is to expand knowledge and understanding. Take the time we need to reflect and engage different viewpoints, especially those with which we may disagree. Consider what questions we might have for the Q&A and direct them to the moderator. Um, so that's uh, the uh, guideline, guidelines and expectations. So now let's move on to, uh, to learn and know and meet our guest speaker, Dr. Hassan Jeffries. Dr. Hassan Jeffries graduated from Morehouse College with a BA in history. He earned a PhD in American history with a specialization in African American history from Duke University. He is currently an associate professor of history at the Ohio State University, teaching, researching, and writing about the African American experience from a historical perspective. Dr. Jeffries takes great pride in opening students' minds to new ways of understanding the past and the present. For his pedagogical creativity and effectiveness, he has received numerous awards, including Ohio State's Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching, the university's highest commendation for teaching. And Dr. Jeffries has chronicled the civil rights movement in the 10 episode Audible original series, Great Figures of the Civil Rights Movement, and has told the remarkable story of the original Black Panther Party in Bloody Lounge, Civil Rights and the Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt, which has been praised as the book historians of the Black Freedom Movement have been waiting for. Dr. Jeffries has collaborated on several public history projects and served as the lead scholar and the primary script writer for the $27 million renovation of the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lauren Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, the site of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
Dr. Jeffries regularly shares his ex uh, expertise on African American history and the contemporary Black politics through public lectures and interviews with print, radio, and the television news outlets. He has also contributed to several documentary film projects as a featured, uh, as a featured on camera scholar, including the Emmy nominated four hour PBS documentary, Black America Since. A uh, Martin Luther King and the Sli Still I Rise. Dr. Jeffrey's com commitment to teaching hard history led him edit Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement, a collection of essays by leading civil rights scholars and teachers that explores how to teach civil rights history accurately and effectively, and to host the podcast Teaching Hard History a proud production of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance Division. He also helps school districts help develop anti-racism programming and the culturally responsive curricular content centered on social studies by conducting professional development workshops for teachers and administrators. And uh, the speakers from UW Platteville include Dr. David Gelada, an associate professor of English. He teaches courses in writing, literature, film, and ethnic studies. Dr. Frank King, an associate professor in ethnic studies and executive director in the Division of Diversity and, in and Inclusion. He teaches on issues of race, class, gender, and sexuality. He specializes in African American studies, hip hop pedagogy, and the prison industrial complex. Dr. Shan Sapleton, an associate professor of political science. She teaches courses in political science, comparative politics, and uh, international relations. And Dr. Stacy Strobel, a professor of criminal justice. She researched policing and minority communities around the world, having been published in a wide variety of academic journals, such as Policing and Society, the International Jour Journal for Crime, Justice and Social D Democracy, and the British Journal of Criminology. She teaches criminal justice courses. Without further ado, let's welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, Thank you, Dr. Jeffries. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Don. I appreciate the, the introduction um, and I'm really excited uh, and the invitation. Uh, and I'm really excited to share some thoughts and ideas with everyone. Uh, I was so in excited. In fact, I, I, I showed up 24 hours early. Uh, I was here yesterday and like, where's everybody at? And I sat for about 10 minutes before I realized that today was not 11-11. Uh, but but I'm here now. I, you know, I, I got some rest and brushed it off. It's the era in which we live. Uh, so I, I, I am looking forward to sharing some some thoughts and ideas. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I have a few uh, slides uh, that I want to share, a few images and the like I want to share with everyone. Um, take us to um, a little bit after the bottom of the hour uh, and then and then toss it back and open it up uh, for some for some conversation, discussion and dialogue. I look forward to hearing uh, from the previous panelists uh, and, and to, uh, for the questions uh, from, from all who are in attendance. So let me go ahead and share my screen now. Um, I've modified my remarks ever so slightly um, because I wanted to work in uh, specifically the, the young, young people. Um, so where do we go from here? The importance of young people to affecting social, to affecting social change. Uh, as Dong had pointed out, I am a historian, and so I want to I want to begin with a little history and kind of walk us forward um, over the last half century or so, uh, and just highlight some of these key moments where we see young people uh, really leading the charge uh, to create social change uh, in America, to to move this democracy forward, uh, and and we really have to begin in 1955. Uh, in August of 1955, 14-year-old uh, young African-American boy from Chicago, Illinois, uh, heads to his mom, puts him on a train uh, down to Mississippi uh, to spend the summer with family members uh, down in Money, Mississippi. Uh, and as she uh, puts young Emmett Till, 1955, August of 1955, uh, on this train to Mississippi to spend time with his cousins and his uh, uncle, his great uncle and the like, um, she, she, she warns him, she cautions him to be careful 
uh, down in Mississippi to mine the color line. This is the height of Jim Crow, uh, a period in which segregation uh, existed not just in the South, but uh, across America, but it was particularly fine uh, in the South where everything was segregated from uh, lunch counters to uh, train stations to cemeteries to the sea, beaches, uh, the water, the Gulf of Mississippi was segregated uh, in fact, um, or attempted to be segregated. So, uh, th and, and we have to keep in mind as well that segregation just wasn't a minor inconvenience, uh, something that um, just made uh, black folk uncomfortable. Uh, segregation, uh, Jim Crow was a system designed uh, to regulate black behavior in order to exploit black labor. And it was enforced by violence. And, and this is what young Emmett Till's mother was trying to convey to him. But at 14 years old, uh, it was hard for him to really make sense of this. He, he understood how to navigate the color line in Chicago, Illinois, uh, but Mississippi was a different story. And so when he goes down there and he's hanging out with his cousins and his friends, um, they head into a candy store. Uh, and apparently, uh, you know, at, at most on the way out of the candy store, uh, he may have said bye uh, to, the, uh, um, to the white woman who was the cashier, uh, but even addressing her uh, in a way that wasn't uh, accepted, uh, in a way that was too familiar, uh, was enough to get young Emmett Till murdered. Uh, that night uh, when that, uh, when his uh, mother, uh, when that, uh, when the husband of the, the cashier, the white cashier came home, uh, she uh, said that young Emmett uh, had somehow insulted her uh, and, and they went out, kidnapped Emmett Till from uh, his, from his uh, uncle's house, uh, took him to a, uh, a barn, not too far from where he uh, was where he was staying, um, beat him, uh, shot him through the head, uh, attached a, a cotton gin belt, a big industrial uh, a fan, a big industrial fan, uh, attached it to his body, wrapping barbed wire to hold it, and then threw his body into the Tallahatchie River. Um, the, the men who kidnapped him, they did not wear masks. Uh, they were uh, they were well known within the community. Uh, Emmett Till's body was eventually recovered a few days later, and Emmett Till's body was shipped uh, to his mother. Uh, she sent him off on a train, and he came back to Chicago in a casket. Uh, and 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 it was devastating not only to uh, Mamie Till, which is his mom, but to the broader to the broader community when people learned about what had happened to Emmett Till. Mamie Till, the mother, makes a um, probably one of the hardest decisions that any mother, uh, any parent could make uh, about a child uh, who died prematurely and died at the hands uh, of folk uh, because of white supremacy. She decides uh, to have an open casket uh, at his funeral and tens of thousands of people in Chicago will come through, stand, would, would, would uh, wait outside and come through and view uh, young Emmett Till's uh, mutilated uh, body. Uh, and, and Jet Magazine takes a photograph, uh, a one, uh, and publishes a photograph, a magazine within the African-American community, Glossy Magazine, takes a photograph of young Emmett Till's mutilated body, his corpse, uh, and, and publishes that magazine. And, and it circulates far and wide within the African-American community. And this is important because that image, that's this story of Emmett Till, of a young black boy from Chicago going to Mississippi, being lynched and then being murdered, kidnapped and murdered. And then uh, the men who did it getting off, they're arrested, they're sent to trial, but an all white jury um, refuses to convict them convenes, uh, uh, you know, uh, for a few minutes uh, and then uh, immediately says uh, not guilty. Uh, and the judge uh, in the case, white judge, uh, dismisses uh, the charges after that. So they would be ne they would never again be brought to would never would be brought to justice. You know, in many cases, that's where the story ends. Young Emmett Till is one of many, one of thousands who get lynched in American history. 
uh, but the decision of his mother to have this open casket, to allow um, the, his body to be seen, to, as she said, let the world see what Jim Crow did to my son, had a powerful effect uh, on those who saw it, especially the young people who saw it. And so we will see, this is 1955, we will see in five years when the sit-ins, this wave of protests led by college students, mostly black college students, almost all black college students, but mostly students at black colleges in the South, this wave of sit-ins that, that washes across the South, uh, that these young people uh, would have been, this, or were, or would have been uh, the same age as Emmett Till had Emmett Till lived. This was the Emmett Till generation, and almost to a person, those who get involved in uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which, be, which emerges out of uh, this sit-in struggle uh, as a sort of a central organization to coordinate uh, uh, direct action activities and later on voting rights activities. I mean, this becomes one of the, the critical and most important organizations uh, within the civil rights movement during this era when public protest is really uh, reaching a height uh, like we have never seen before in the black freedom struggle that almost to a person, uh, no matter where they lived, if they were in the South or in the North, Chicago or Mississippi or New York or California, whether they were uh, young men or young women, when when asked about what motivated you, what, what sparked you, they, they talk about the bigger problems uh, that they face, Jim Crow, segregation, discrimination, but they also talked about seeing those pictures of Emmett Till. They talked about um, realizing then uh, that this just wasn't a minor inconvenience that their parents were trying to shelter them from, that there but for the grace of God uh, go they individually. Uh, and so, you know, at 14 and 15 years old, when they're at high school and they're at home, there's, you know, th th there's limited options that they could do during this particular moment in time. But when they got to college, when they got a little bit more space and a little bit more freedom to act on their own, that is exactly what they do. And they all recall and talk about uh, Emmett Till, saying that this is very much not only for me and my life going forward, but this is about uh, Emmett Till. And not only the murder, and this is so important, this is the form about criminal justice, but about what happened to Emmett Till afterward. The fact that, or those who, who murdered Emmett Till, the fact that they are never brought to justice, the fact that they confess after the fact and nothing can be done about them. So the, the, what we see as the young people who uh, are really making this movement happen in the 1960s, uh, that they are inspired, uh, motivated, catalyzed, uh, by the death, the murder uh, of a young person of their own age. We often and too often, I think, when we think about how does, how does change get created in American society, we, we look at the civil rights movement and the height of the civil rights movement, uh, and we say, oh, that's wonderful. But then when we get to black power, uh, we suddenly say, well, let's not quite deal with black power. We're not sure what that was all about. It must be about some hate white people and all this other stuff. Well, no, that wasn't the case at all. Black power is a logical extension of the civil, of civil rights era organizing. But there is something unique about the black power impetus, the black power impulse. So whereas we were talking about uh, this Emmett Till generation that is inspired by the, not only the murder of Emmett Till, but the injustice that follows, uh, when we begin to think about black power, it's very important to focus on Malcolm X because Malcolm X offers a critical voice, not just about sort of segregation in the South and discrimination in the South. But Malcolm X coming out of Harlem, based in Harlem, and organizing uh, within the Nation of Islam, primarily in the Northeast, Midwest, and West, Malcolm X is giving voice to criticisms of life and racial discrimination and racism in the North. And, and a, a critical aspect of that criticism was interactions with the police. So Malcolm X is offering, he's not only talking about the problem of racism, as being a national problem. He's talking about other critical issues that stem from it, such as job discrimination, such as housing, uh, uh, housing, uh, uh, poor access, uh, uh, not having access to decent housing. Um, and, and, and critically, 
this interaction with police and the criminal justice system. So a lot of what Malcolm is giving voice to, because Malcolm isn't quite the, the grassroots, or, grassroots organizer, he's a master recruiter for the Nation of Islam, uh, but he's not an organizer like we would see in Mississippi with these young folk uh, in, in SNCC in Alabama. But, but Malcolm has this voice. He's able to sort of frame these issues, housing, job discrimination, like what about policing? And what do we do about the policing, the problem of policing, the problem of state violence directed against African-Americans and black folk that will catalyze another generation of young people. This generation of young people uh, are really the Malcolm X generation and they are embodied uh, most clearly by the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense that emerges in Oakland, California in 1966, inspired symbolically, but also uh, by the organizing activities that happened happen in the South in Lowndes County, Alabama and rural Alabama. So again, we see this connection between uh, what's going on in the South and the rural South, which really gives rise to the term and slogan black power and what's happening in urban centers across the country. But the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense will be looking to, Malcolm X of course is killed in February of 1965, assassinated by uh, political opponents, but the, the, his, the power of his voice, his legacy gets, really serves as this uh, inspiration for those who will become active, young people still, former activists in the civil rights era, but additionally new young people who have been living outside of the South, it becomes Malcolm's voice, Malcolm's uh, words, Malcolm's spirit becomes the inspiration for uh, this new, uh, this extension of the civil rights movement. Uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense uh, emerges, as I said, in Oakland, California in 1966. And, and what do they do? What's their focus uh, when they come into being? Their focus uh, is police violence and police misconduct. One of the first things, the, their, their first action uh, after coming into being in the Oakland, uh, in the Oakland Bay Area is to go on police patrols, to watch the police, to police the police. Right? Because why? Is this something that was just a sort of like, hey, we just got to figure out what the police are doing? No, the police and policing was a big problem. In other words, in the 1960s, like we think about racial terrorism and we think about racial violence um, as being something that was confined to the South. We, we, we think about it in terms of sort of clan violence, right? Like, oh, the clan is killing people and all this other stuff down in the South or lynchings, right? The era of lynching was much earlier, but you're still having um, people who are being murdered. But every, listen to me on this, and this is, this, is what, this is why the Black Panthers, as they begin to organize, they're focusing on uh, the police and criminal justice. Uh, every major metropolitan uh, city, a uh, metropolitan area outside of the South in America. You, you, you choose it. It could be Detroit, uh, it could be Milwaukee, New York City, uh, where I'm from, Oakland, California. Every, every single major metropolitan area the, in, it, it, during, during the height of the civil rights movement. So let's go from 1940s to the early 1970s. Pick one, you choose. They were responsible for the deaths of more African-Americans than racial terror groups like the Klan in the entire South every single year. So your likelihood of being killed uh, by police far exceeded your likelihood of being killed by terror groups in the South. But when we think about racial violence during the era, we're always focused on these hooded folk with Klan. The Klansmen were not focused on the police. The police were the racial terrorists that African-Americans had to deal with. And so when we talk about the Malcolm X generation, we talk about the Black Panthers, that becomes the focus of their activism to get police to stop killing black people, to get police to stop harassing uh, black people, arresting black people. This is still before the era of mass incarceration. So we're not warehousing black folk yet, but the culture of policing had already been established. And this is what the Black Panthers were trying to deal with. And so we, we, we think about um, uh, the Panthers as being sort of coming out of Oakland, California, but chapters would emerge across the, across the country. Uh, Milwaukee had a big, uh, a very active chapter. Illinois had an active, or oh, Wisconsin in Milwaukee had an active chapter. Illinois had a chapter. Uh, and the chairman 
of that chapter in Illinois was Fred Hampton, young African American who got his organizing start with the NAACP uh, right there in uh, Illinois, in, outside of uh, in Mayfield, outside of Chicago. And which is important, right? Because again, we see the links between civil rights activism and black power activism. And what was a focus of, of the work that they were doing in Illinois? Stop the police from harassing and killing African-Americans. Now they will do other things as well. They will engage in what they call survival programs, free breakfast, uh, medical, providing medical services uh, to, the, to, 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 to poor, low income folk, engaging in interracial organizing. We see with the Panthers, uh, the creation in Oakland, in uh, uh, Illinois, the creation of what they call the Rainbow Coalition, reaching out uh, to working class uh, white folk, Latinos, uh, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans who had large populations uh, in, in, in Chicago, and creating this Rainbow Coalition. Just as Malcolm X is assassinated, just uh, we see that um, Fred Hampton uh, would be assassinated. He would be killed, murdered by the police. Uh, in a, a raid of the Panthers headquarters, had been uh, intentionally drugged and sedated uh, by a, a, a police informant. Uh, and then uh, there's a raid designed clearly, uh, and the state of Illinois had to settle a suit after this, uh, to assassinate uh, the, 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 the very charismatic, uh, very popular uh, Fred Hampton. Uh, there's a movie, just, just so you know, there's a movie that's about to come out, long overdue, if you will, on the uh, assassination of Fred Hampton that should be out. I don't know if we can still go to movies, but somehow, y'all, young y'all students, y'all know how to watch stuff now. Y'all just figure out how to watch it, but keep an eye out for it because uh, it, should, it, should be, it should be very powerful. But there's this Malcolm X generation. Again, young people organizing, coming together, catalyzing or thinking about police violence and actually being effective. Because one of the things that comes out of, we talked about the Emmett Till generation, what do they do? What do they succeed in doing? They actually succeed in ending Jim Crow, right? Not only desegregating lunch counters, they end Jim Crow. They, they, they get federal law on the books that says no more segregation. They get a voting rights act, reenfranchising African-Americans. Well, what's going on with the Malcolm X generation? Well, they do not succeed uh, in eliminating police violence, uh, but they do succeed uh, in electing African Americans, right, to public office. One of the things that we don't think about with the, the Black Power era is that it's in the Black Power era with young people before they could even vote, uh, you know, 18, 19, uh, 20 years old before the voting age had dropped. They are leading the charge to elect African Americans to public office. What do we do with the vote now that we have it in hand? They're the ones who are saying, here, this is what we need to do. Let's get black folk in office. Let's get people in office who are gonna be responsive to our needs. We can fast forward uh, a little bit uh, in, in chronologically uh, to the early 1980s and we see an African-American um, elected uh, mayor of uh, Chicago. Uh, that you can draw a direct line uh, between Harold Washington being elected mayor of Chicago uh, and the organizing of the Black Panthers and this Malcolm X generation young people really at the forefront of affecting social, social change. If we fast forward um, you know, a couple decades uh, to just seven years or so, again, uh, we see something very similar again, young people emerging at the forefront of activism and creating social change. Uh, in February of 2012, 17 year old Trayvon Martin down in uh, Florida uh, is murdered, uh, murdered by uh, not by police, but by a wannabe, wannabe police, uh, a fellow who was um, fancied himself as a, as a um, uh, sort of public safety uh, person for the residence in which he lived. Um, this wouldn't be the first time. Uh, this is not the first time since uh, Emmett Till that somebody gets murdered by extra legal violence. Uh, and it wouldn't be the last time uh, we saw just most recently uh, in, in uh, Georgia, uh, Ahmed Aubrey, uh, hunted down and murdered by, by two white men in Georgia. Uh, but what, what, what's so striking about Trayvon Martin's case, again, uh, is, not the act, is the act, but it's more than the act, just like Emmett Till. What was so striking was the act, but it was more than the act. It was the, it was the absence of justice. And so uh, Trayvon Martin's killer is allowed to walk away is literally allowed to walk away after he murders 
uh, Trayvon Martin, right? He claims self-defense, he walks away, right? It will be a month uh, and we begin to see like protests building, like, wait, demanding justice. Again, people demanding justice within the criminal justice system. And this is when you had all those, those, those crazy, I was about to curse, but I didn't. This is when you had those crazy stand your ground laws, right? I mean, we see, and then they use that to sort of keep from, um, from arresting him. But because of political pressure uh, led by people in, in, involving large amounts of young people uh, in Florida, uh, the, there is eventually an arrest of the person who kills Trayvon Martin. But uh, in June of the next year, uh, the uh, person who was arrested, George Zimmerman, and his tribe is eventually acquitted. Uh, you know, acquitted of, of murder, acquitted of manslaughter, right? And that's it. He goes free, he walks away free, right? Follow this 17-year-old boy, kills this 17-year-old boy, and doesn't face justice. So what we see coming out as an aftermath of, of Trayvon Martin is very similar to what we saw coming uh, from in, in the aftermath of of Emmett Till. We see the emergence of a Trayvon Martin generation. There are uh, young people uh, who begin to uh, not just protest, but organize. Uh, we see formations of, uh, of new um, uh, protest groups. Um, the BYP Young Hunter, Black Young Pe Youth Project. Um, we see down in Florida, uh, young people organizing, holding a uh, a, a staging a sit-in, a takeover uh, of the governor's uh, office, uh, demanding demanding justice. We see the hashtag uh, Black Lives Matter really taking off for the first time. And that becomes really the name for the political movement that would emerge. And then the following year uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, we see after the death of Michael Brown at the hands of police and his body is just laid out there, and then we see people uh, really beginning to take to the streets. And this, of course, uh, isn't just sort of random folk. Folk come out because they're upset, they're frustrated, they want justice, they demand action. But what we also see are those organizations, those young people who had been working since Trayvon Martin had been, his murderer had been acquitted, that they begin to expand their reach in states like Ohio, in states like Illinois, uh, in states like Florida, and they begin to talk. And this becomes critical because what we see in Ferguson isn't just a flash in the pan. It becomes a sustained effort uh, over the course of several, several months. Now, justice isn't done in Ferguson. Uh, the uh, officer uh, is eventually, um, there's a grand jury uh, that, is, uh, that is in panel, but that grand jury uh, refuses to bring an indictment. Uh, now, one of the things that happens uh, when we're thinking about solutions to criminal justice, and we'll save a, you know, some time for discussions about that, is what, what as, as activists and young people were watching this play out, they were like, wait a minute, well, well, what kind of prosecutor, what kind of DA is this, right? Like, like this is, like, what's happening? Like, how could you not? We're, we're always told that, you know, a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich unless that ham sandwich is like in the hands of a white police officer, apparently. Uh, because, you know, how, how does this play out? I right? said, like, well, you know, the DA, the prosecutor, he just said, well, here's all the information. Prosecutor did essentially a data dump, right? The prosecutor did not want to prosecute this case, did not want to prosecute that officer. Just as we saw most recently uh, down in Louisville, Kentucky, the state attorney did not want to prosecute that off those officers who were responsible for killing Breonna Taylor. And so that becomes a wake up call. And by data dump, I mean just anything and everything. Like, here, y'all make a decision rather than a directed instruction of like, look, you need to focus on this. These are the circumstances, these are the issues. This is the evidence that you really need to, to focus on. But as a result of that, in similar cases, we begin to see real change, right? So for example, uh, right here, I I'm in Ohio and just up the road, I'm in Columbus, but in Cleveland, Ohio, shortly after the Ferguson uprising and the killing of, of, of Michael Brown, we see the killing of 12 year old Tamir Rice. Uh, who has a toy gun and police roll up on him, hop out of the car within less than two seconds, shoot him dead. Well, the prosecutor there refuses to indict those officers as well. And so what happens? Young people, students from Ohio State who had graduated and started organizing um, across the state, they actually organize a campaign to get that prosecutor thrown out of office. And when that election then comes two years 
later, they succeed in replacing the district attorney in Cleveland, Ohio. And so that becomes one of those things because that district, district attorneys are powerful, right? Prosecutors are powerful, probably the most powerful office in the criminal justice system. And so what we see in terms of change is folk beginning to focus on those positions. And this last, this last uh, slide, and then I'll, I'll turn it over, open it up, and we can talk more about what can be done going forward, uh, is of course what happened this summer uh, following the murder, Memorial Day murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Uh, but also building on a series of murders, right, that have been going on. Uh, you know, the Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, I mentioned Ahmed Aubrey, but specifically the, you know, sort of police killing. You know, one of the things that has happened over the last 10 years from the best statistics that we have with regard to police violence is that it hasn't changed, police murders, it hasn't changed. Basically, we're talking about 1,000 police murders a year, uh, every year over the last decade. So even after the reforms that occurred, after a Ferguson in which we invested more in police by providing more money for training and for cameras, it has had almost no effect uh, on the number of police killings. And this is significant because when we look at the stats, when we look at the numbers, you're talking about roughly 300 to 350 African-Americans die at the hands of the police, at, at hands of police every year. You say, okay, well, what does that mean? What's the context for that? Well, during the height of lynching, during the early 20th century, only about 100 African-Americans die at the hands of lynch mobs, right? And that, that look, it's not only, that means two a week, right? We're talking about three times as many African-Americans today die at the hands of police than, than died at the hands of lynch mobs at the early 20th century. And we know that part of the, part of the power uh, of lynching was the message that is sent to the black community that anybody could be murdered at any moment for any reason whether it was a real or perceived transgression of the color line. And that sentiment is still very much felt uh, today. That's what's so scary. At any moment, a black person's life could be taken away. And so in response to those um, that ongoing, uh, that particular murder, but of course, uh, the deaths of others, we see uh, the emergence of Black Lives Matter protests this summer. Uh, the, we're talking about a George Floyd, Breonna Taylor generation right, that is building on the work and the organizing of those who had come together in the wake of Trayvon Martin's generation, who had learned from an older generation of activists, but this is also something that we have never seen before, right? We're talking about in the first few weeks after the, after the killing, after Memorial Day, uh, as many estimates have, as many as 25, maybe even 30 million people took to the streets. That means we saw this summer the largest demonstrations, the largest protests in American history is not even close. The March on Washington was the single largest demonstration uh, during the civil rights movement. That only had about 200,000, 250,000 people. So we're talking about 35, 30 million people, you know, taking to the streets. So that is meaningful. Uh, now the question then becomes, what kind of pressure can you put uh, on government? Uh, and, you know, and that pressure uh, had already began to bear fruit when we think about, uh, you know, our neighbors sort of in between us and uh, um, uh, uh, in, in, here in the Midwest, um, this Minneapolis and the University of uh, 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 Minnesota uh, saying, hey, we're going to sever our relationship with the Minneapolis uh, Police Department uh, until they get this stuff in order, right? Until they get, you know, they, they get a handle on this. Uh, and you had many other uh, cities uh, that were uh, moving to uh, reduce police budgets, which in many ways are, are overblown and inflated. Uh, but Going forward, pressure has to be kept on. When thinking about solutions, you're going to have internal solutions, you're going to have external solutions, but either way, you got to have pressure, right? So the Black Lives Matter protest, that wave of protest, created pressure on elected officials to do something. But as soon as we begin to see those fade away, what begins to happen? In New York City, city council starts rethinking and talking about, well, maybe we won't cut as much money or we'll find some other Holy uh, alternative shit. avenues. That's what I said too. Uh, you'll have these other you'll have these other things rolling back. So the pressure is essential because nothing is nothing is permanent, right? No like no politics are permanent, right? Like that's why you need that that pressure and imagining, you know, what could be different. I'll say this last word and then I'll I'll open it up. Um, and I think this has to do with uh, folk who were talking about um, and claiming defund police and defund the police. What does this mean? You know. I think it is important, and, and we saw this through all these generations of young people, 
to be able to imagine a different world, to be able to imagine a society, uh, not just where justice exists, but a society in which we don't need police. Just period. Like that's not that shouldn't be a radical statement. That's just a that's just a function of thinking. Can we con can you conceive of a society in which there is no need for police? Like and that 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 shouldn't be a partisan issue, right? That should be that should be what we should all be striving for. That means we live in a safe society. That means we live in a cooperative society. That is what we should want. And so when people are organizing, taken to the streets, and they're talking about defund police or refund. They just think about how can we reimagine our society so we no longer have to deal with em the, the, the tragedies that befell an Emmett Till or Trayvon Martin and the lack of justice that followed. That's all it is. I think that becomes a starting point for all these solutions. We need to work backwards from that and say, okay, if that's where we want to go as a society, a place where we are all can walk through this world safely, then how do we get there? And what are the steps that we can take to get there? Well, thank you very much. And Don, I, I will stop sharing and I will turn it back over to you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Jeffries, thank you. Thank you so much. You just um, gave me a, a very, very clear picture now. Just like I used to swim in the mud. It's like, you know, how am I going to make all the connections? And um, and also I, I really enjoyed um, your kind of, um, you know, telling the audience about giving the younger generations space and to reimagine a world, imagine what's, what we can do, you know, from this time forward. And also, I remember it's hard to uh, use, you give a, a TED talk talking about teaching hard history. So it's not about repeating history, it's about, you know, stopping or preventing history from continuing so i really you know that's a powerful point i got and also uh, ruby bridges recently published a book it's called ruby bridges it's uh, 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 it's like this is your time i think uh, that's also a very very powerful book for the younger generation to read it's like what kind of change can we effect you know by studying by looking back at history so I think uh, that's really powerful. So at this point, uh, Dr. Jeffries, I'm going to get the prior forum speakers to to share their kind of visions of reimagining, you know, change and coming up with solutions, and then we are going to uh, have a conversation. Okay. So, uh, um, so Stacy, uh, do you want to go? Sure. Dr. Jeffries, thank you so much. That was um, a fabulous um, telling of, of, of the threads of, of what we're dealing with in terms of institutional racism from Emmett Till today, Emmett Till to today. Um, it's, you know, it's a really important narrative and um, I wish that our public schools taught history uh, this way and maybe not the way some of our textbooks are written. Um, I really loved how you ended on this notion of imagination. Uh, because as a police scholar, even though we don't often associate imagination with policing, I've been thinking very similarly in that we really need to have all ideas on the table. And as much as we have a crisis of social justice, we also have a crisis of imagination. Um, and I love that you're saying that the goal is safety. You know, maybe there's this, this perfect world in the future where, where we, we have a level of safety where we, we hardly need these protectors at all, right? Um, and, and what and if we can keep that goal in mind, then what we're doing in between are, as you're saying, these, these stepping stones to get there. Um, and that can help orient us, I think. Um, I think it's very apt. It will help orient us to something that perhaps is more just and, and fair for everyone. Um, your talk reminded me of my time as a grad student. I was um, raised in criminal justice in, in New York City. That's where I did grad school. And one of my jobs um, in grad school was to evaluate a program called Cops and Kids, a very small program um, that John Jay College of Criminal Justice was engaging with, um, and Dr. Maria Volpe in particular. And what it was, um, and so this is the early 2000s, late 1990s. And, and what, what it was was a program where community-oriented police officers and juvenile officers would go to a community center um, in a public housing project on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and they would just hang out, whether it was playing ping pong or um, you know, watching a film or, do, or doing something else together. Um, and the idea was that it would, um, the, the kids were like the tween age 
And the idea was that we were developing a dialogue between two groups that may find themselves at odds um, in the teenage years, which were um, you know, young people of color living in pe public housing projects and, and those that were policing them. Um, and it was an interesting time in New York City because this is the time where you're seeing more representation of police officers of color. Um, that's, that's a growing thing. And so things seem to be opening up. Um, and certainly as a graduate student watching the interaction, um, there was some genuine um, barriers that broke down and stereotypes that were um, worked with. And a lot of really good stuff happened in this, this little program. And it was hard as an uh, evaluator and an observer to think, you know, think anything wrong of this. You know, you would want to give more money to something like this. But what's so curious about it um, and so important is that this was one pocket in an NYPD that on the other hand was after 9-11 very militarized, um, was deploying tactical units into, you know, uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods that ends up with an Amadou Diallo shooting, if you if folks remember, where somebody's reaching for their cell phone and ends up with 41 shots. This is the same time period that uh, the NYPD are disproportionately stopping and frisking uh, young people of color. Um, and young people of color will tell you that they feel surveilled, that their life experience is very different than their white counterparts. So this is all going on at the same time. So sorry for the long story, but um, for me, for policing, we needed an imagination and we needed imagination around a cohesive set of social justice. So policing has had some programs and some departments and some pockets here and there that have been really progressive, but that's not going to undo the kinds of horror that people witness uh, when we have situations like Trayvon Martin, where we have situations like Eric Garner um, and everybody's name who we could say in the say your names frame, right? That undoes all that other good work. And so what it says to me is that we have pockets, it, it's so uneven and we've got pockets of, as, and I, as I talked about last time in my presentation, we still have the pockets of the subculture of, of racist police. It's still there uh, and, and, it, and it is, coming from this unbroken institutional line of racism within policing as a piece of the culture. Um, but there's also pockets of people trying to get beyond that. And so the imagination we need is to make it not pockets, but to really think about the core function of police as being to change this narrative. The core function, not the specialized unit, not the community police officers, but everybody's job is is to, uh, to protect the lives of, of, of people. And that means a special emphasis on protecting the lives of those who have not been protected before, people of color. Um, and so I, I don't wanna take up too much time, but the, the one thing that I think would really make a difference is to get rid of, as I mentioned this in my presentation, to get rid of the Graham versus Connor standard for use of force that's entirely based on the subjective experience of the police officer and to move towards the sanctity of life framework where it is on the police to be engaged in de-escalation and doing everything humanly possible to prevent violent outcomes, uh, which isn't the current standard. And so I think that would go a long way towards potentially making a difference so that any good work that's done maybe in a community policing unit isn't, isn't undone through a high profile horrible incident. Um, and I'll leave it there for my other presenters to, to speak, but thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries. Really appreciated your talk. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Strobo. And so next, let's move on to Dr. Frank King. Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Jeffries. Once again, um, really appreciate your presenting and, and coming here. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the, the idea of defunding police. Um, I think Dr. Jeffries brought it up and uh, other colleagues brought it up for the previous presentations and my cat just decided he wants to get in my face right now. Uh, so I wanted to know, I wanted to talk about the, the, the purpose of the police in the United States and the historical purpose of the police in the United States. And, and we can see that the police historically have been a way of ensuring there's a separation between the haves and the have nots in our society. And we could say that, you know, just the origin of policing in general from the European model has always been from to ensure that those in power maintain power and the police have been used as a tool of suppression to keep that away from people without power. So in the United States, we talk about the, the purpose of police and, and, and our, my colleagues uh, in the previous discussion uh, brought this up. Uh, 
in the United States, we can look at the history of the growth of police were one in ensuring and protecting uh, outposts from indigenous populations and the police reform as uh, a militia to uh, fight off uh, indigenous populations that were pretty much trying to protect, protect their livelihoods uh, from uh, uh, pioneers uh, from Europe and also slave and plantation patrols. Uh, as this in the South, the the growth of the police because the police uh, there was never a police force, uh, maybe a sheriff in a town that was there to so, supposedly uphold law, but this idea from American mythology of the 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 Western police and sheriff uh, that never was a thing that ever existed. And so our police force in the South was essentially done for from uh, to to uh, maintain plantations to uh, capture runaway slaves. So they actually had badges. They were deputed, deputized people uh, to uh, uh, capture slaves to ensure that there were no slave revolts or any resistance. But in the North, it was a little bit different. So the police were uh, not necessarily established, but they grow as an anti-immigrant force the arrival of Irish, Polish, Italian immigrants specifically, uh, they are suppressed by the police. But here's the thing, something changes. And so we create this idea of the police growing uh, with an immigrant population as members of the police force. So what happens here is that uh, in a lot of places, Boston, you have Italian, I mean, not Italian, but Irish immigrants becoming the police. You have in Chicago, you have Polish uh, immigrants becoming the police. Uh, there was one book, uh, Capital and Punishment, that I just read, and it's talking about the police were 40% plus of immigrants. And most of those immigrants were Polish. Baltimore also, I'm from Maryland. And so Baltimore, also a large population. It becomes a stereotype of a generations of police that were, hey, my kid was a police, my, my parents were police, my grandparents were police, and oftentimes they were uh, folks that were immigrants. And that growth of the Irish, Polish, Italian uh, police force comes out of union busting. So those groups that were uh, once oppressed by the police are recruited by wealthy business owners uh, to suppress unions. So we can see the history of the police force as being a form of oppression and subjugation of people that are either fighting for the rights or people that are just fighting for the rights to exist. And so we have to look at that. And, and, and so Dr. Jeffries brought up this great idea of just imagining ourselves without police. What is the purpose of our police force? Do police stop crime? No. What do police do? They investigate crime after the fact. You don't call the police when the uh, when you're you're you know, you're robbed. You call the police after you find out that you were robbed. You know, unless you know, of course, there's other situations, of course, arise. But I'm saying that they're there to find out. They don't stop the murder. They investigate the murder afterwards. So, our ideas of police being a deterrent, we could say that. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of statistical evidence that shows that that's not the case. So that idea of defunding the police is something that's a possibility. So you look at uh, politicians today, uh, John Clyburn, who is probably one of the most powerful people in the Democratic Party, he's the majority whip in the House, and he's Black from South Carolina. And he says that a reason why the Democratic Party did not dominate this election cycle the way they sh were projected to do is because of oftentimes people being linked to defunding the police or having the narrative of defunding the police and they were lied. That's not necessarily true. Because if we look at the history of the Democratic Party for the last couple of decades, it, they've been supportive of defunding policies also, but not the police. They've been supportive of defunding Social, security, social safety nets, they've been in support of defunding education. So 
there's been a lot of times president our president elect Joe Biden has said, and this has been something that he's been criticized heavily for, is saying, hey, we need to take away money from our social safety nets. We need to take away money from social security. Well, the same thing it, that is celebrated from that circle is criticized when we talk about the police. It's like the police cannot be criticized in any way, shape, or form. I'm an educator. I criticize our education system every single day, you know, and I want to criticize it more because I want it to be better. But if you say that you are criticizing the police in some way, then you're against our American society. You're looked at as un-American. You know, in a way, it's kind of like that 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 false not, uh, idea of not supporting the troops. So take a, yourself away from what our popular canon is about understanding the origin of the police or understanding this idea of being critical of police because we can be in you know for all the uw platteville students and people in platteville you know you drive down the street and how many times you see like back to blue or i support the badges or anything like that it's like we can't do that but you know do we ever have anything like that when somebody says we need to get rid of uh, education funding we don't say like support the teachers or we don't see that in in that way and in it's like the the police have no uh, way of being criticized in our society at all. And defunding is not saying get rid of the police. There are people that want to abolish police. And Dr. Jeffries brought up a, an ideal society that can actually exist in which the police does not necessarily exist, particularly the way we look at it. You know, I'm sure that we could and look at how pop culture has viewed the police, you know, how many police shows are out there that celebrate and, and give this narrative of the police being wonderful and great. And so I just wanted to talk about just like be creative in understanding and understand the origin of the police and understand that the idea of defunding police uh, is a possibility that we can look at to make a more just society. And I will let uh, Dr. Gelada go next. Hi. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeffries. Thanks, Frank. Frank, that's super fascinating what you were saying about um, uh, immigrants um, becoming police. And I guess once you said it, I was like, oh, yeah, I think I knew that. But I hadn't really like made the connection before. And it's super interesting because, um, you know, and I'm, as I know, you're aware um, that uh, that oftentimes when new immigrant groups come to America, uh, there's a period of them becoming white, right? Uh, they're seen as a kind of uh, ethnic other, right? Or something like that when they first get here or or, or at best like an off-white or something. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of work on uh, Irish Americans and Jewish Americans and Italian Americans and that process of like becoming white over time. And I've never thought about the role that uh, that becoming police <laughs> it might be a step in becoming white uh, at the same time. That's really fascinating. Um, and anyway, uh, and I guess with that in mind, I'm really only going to talk for like a minute because I want to I want to make sure there's time for Q and A. Uh, with with whiteness in mind, I just wanted to bring up um, what I see as a um, as as a, an element to keep in mind when we're talking about activism and social change, which is the the role of the of the kind of white ally um, or of uh, of white allyship. And uh, I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail because again, I want to open up the Q and A. But I encourage I'm white, just so you guys know. Um, I encourage anybody um, out there who's interested to seek out resources uh, for effective ways of, uh, of, of white allyship. Uh, there's many on campus. Uh, Caden Carpenter and Emily Steyer have been leading talks about this uh, all summer long, um, white accountability and things along those lines. Um, but just right off the bat, just even if you're um, uh, if, if you, if you identify as white and you're interested in, in social justice issues, um, just right off the bat, a couple things to like think about. And one is, uh, find ways of, of decentering yourself and of decentering your own kind of emotions and start thinking about ways of, uh, of listening and following the lead of others. Right. Uh, in Dr. Jeffrey's talk, one of the things that he brought up and that we saw in those slides over and over again was the strong black leadership that was there. And, um, and we should keep in mind that it's up to, uh, to white people who are interested in social justice as well to, to follow that black leadership and kind of take their lead in that um, and to be, um, uh, to be an effective supporter in these fights. And that's all I'm gonna say on this and I'm gonna turn it over. I wanna make sure that we have lots of time uh, for Q&A as well. 
Thank yes, you. thank you, Dr. Gilada. So let's move on to Dr. Sepulton. Uh, thank you. Um, good night, y'all. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Jeffers. I really enjoy that talk. And I have two points, um, one of which I don't know how I'm going to make connect, but I feel like I kept thinking of this, like it's supposed to be funny, but I don't know if it will come across. And it's speaking to like the first um, issue of consequences, right? So Dr. Jeffers went through a lot of the slides and showing at all of these key points throughout history, right? One of the things that almost always happens is there isn't sufficient consequences for taking the life of Emmett Till or what happened with Trayvon or Tamir Rice or all of these. And so like when we were thinking about these things, you're like, oh, well, hmm, what's the big deal with this consequence? Well, it's a big deal. And this example that I'm going to share is in an international concept because in the international context, because that's what I do, right? Um, and it's a um, reference to a story that um, the scholar uh, Walter Rodney actually writes in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And he relayed the story um, um, how he's from Guyana, uh, which is closer to Latin America, right? Um, South America. Um, he's not at all Jamaican, but in Britain, he was attending Oxford. And in Britain, at the same time, he would bristle at being like considered Jamaican, like, oh, we're not all people with black people with accents, Jamaican, right? Um, he would also enjoy being assumed to be Jamaican, presumed to be Jamaican when he was riding the train. Well, why? When he's on a train, he's observed that when it's, um, when um, the majority people, right, were interacting with people with accents who happen to be black, um, if they're not assumed to be Jamaican, they get like 10 times ruder and like do not curb necessarily their acts of racism. Um, when, however, it's a Jamaican, they tend to be better at minding their P's and Q's. Well, why? Um, because, well, Jamaicans have this reputation, male or female, like if you're rude, you get smacked, right? And I'm not advocating violence here. I'm just saying, right, consequences, right? What are the consequences if, in fact, this person happens to be a Jamaican? It might mean on that day you get smacked. And so that informs the behavior of individuals. They're less likely if they're assumed that the individuals on the train were Jamaican to behave poorly, right? So in other words, how do I link this back? In as much as, right, taking the lives of African-American, which are deemed to be as meaningful as any other individual life, and there are consequences for those that do, right? That is the ways in which, the way in which um, these behavior, these actions um, um, get prevented or the, act as a deterrent mechanism. Um, and then, my second point, main point here that I want to talk to is the importance of historical understanding, right? So there's a vast lack of awareness from where I sit anyways, about the ways in which systems of oppression or oppressive structures within our society work, right? And how they historically have been embedded within our society, right? So we're talking about when we say institutional racism, it's not some just mere attitudes, but those attitudes do come from somewhere. They're informed historically. So what is that historical context? Dr. Jeffers talked about white supremacy. Now we're like, oh yay, white supremacy, whatever. Well, no, we're talking about these historical institutions that still inform even today, the ways in which we, our views, the way that our attitudes, right? Um, so in, in, in terms of understanding the Rayburn Martin case, as Dr. Jeffries appropriately pointed out, right, it's immediately, oh, but he had a hoodie on, as if that's not the normal wear of teenagers um, that are 17 years or older. But somehow, again, we are not understanding the ways in which these historical oppressive systems work and where we fall within those oppressive systems, whether we are among the advantage groups or the disadvantaged groups, the ways in which those in the advantage groups then view those in the disadvantaged groups, the oppressed groups, as, oh, those are the problem. So Trayvon Martin and his hoodie properly became the problem. So then solutions that are proposed are to fix the Trayvon Martins of the world rather than the structures, these oppressive structures that exist, right? And so I want to speak directly to my lovely students who are on here. And what I want you to do, um, like Dr. Jeffers talked about this, reimagining the 
future is up to you. I wondered how I would lay this heavy burden upon you today to say that, okay, those who are in power right now kind of have failed. And now it's for you to save us all. And so what I want you to really do is to take his charge of reimagining, right? You've figured out how to make TikTok videos in like a minute or second or whatever. You can do this too. Like I believe in you. Actually, my future relies on you doing well. In about three or four or five years, whatever, you're going to become the future um, police officers. You are going to become the future policy uh, makers. You're going to become, ooh, I've read some of your work, so I'm worried about saying this, but you're going to become the future congressman and president of this country, right? And so now you're being asked to go figure out, try to understand the ways in which these oppressive systems work, right? Your positionality within it so that you don't get the, I think one student was concerned about, I don't wanna be a white savior, or as I call it, the teach for America dilemma where you're fixing those people, right? Um, we get away from that and you in fact have meaningful societal change. Why? Because you fundamentally understand the underlying causes and your policies hopefully will be targeted towards fixing those underlying pro pro um, problems rather than, right, these incremental steps that we're taking. And just FYI, right, Dr. Gelato just spoke to this. Yes, African-Americans, people of color in general need to take the charge. But you're the majority, you have to be in this, right? Again, my future, my rich melanated awesomeness and folks like me like that, depend on you getting involved, not seeing this as just a black issue, right? And if you truly do believe in democracy, democracy requires the championing of equality for all, right? And that includes people melanin rich like myself being treated as equals. That means when we live, our lives should be as rich and we should have all the access to the opportunities. And when we're killed unfairly, we should also receive justice for that. And I will end there. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sapoten. Uh, Dr. Jeffries, so yeah, so I gave you a little bit kind of break and now um, I'm bringing you back. Yeah, you know, if I could just say, just wanted to thank you so much to everyone who shared. I mean, it was really fantastic. My mind, the wheels in my mind are just, uh, are just turning so many things. I mean, even just the, the, the last, thinking about the students and, and the young people who are listening, um, Dr. Sapleton, I mean, it's absolutely right like you all are responsible for the future, what you are not responsible for, and this is important, you're not responsible for the past. Like nothing that has happened in the past, all the mistakes that have been made in the past from slavery on up, you're not responsible for, you're not even responsible for the mess that exists today. <laughs> like that's not on you, right? But you are responsible uh, as was just so eloquently put out for tomorrow. Like that is on you. And, 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 it's, and you, you're responsible for solving the problems, the solving the problems of injustice, the persistence of injustice. And the only way that you can do that, as was just so beautifully laid out, is if you understand the underlying causes. That's why it's so critical as a historian and all the work that we do to understand how did we get here? That's the purpose of looking back. That's the purpose of taking a moment to understand in the present so that you can address these things in ways that we have been unable to do up until this point. And that means everybody has to be involved. There's no, you know, if, if we truly do believe in democracy, that means everybody, whether you're black, you're white, if you're here, you bear part of the responsibility for fixing the society and creating the, 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 the justice, uh, a system of justice that we are all uh, deserve. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries. Um, I think uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, had a very powerful quote that also directly speaks to uh, the, the champions in the audience and the future champions for social change. And he said, we will err and falter as we climb the unfamiliar slopes of steep mountains, but there is no alternative well-trod level path and uh, there will be agonizing setbacks along with creative um, advances. So I think uh, this uh, kind of, you know, we don't have, you know, that kind of a clear, sometimes we have to, you know, tumble and stumble, but eventually we're going to figure out. So it's up to us to collectively to uh, discuss, to listen, uh, then to advocate and to seek out resources and to find coalition no matter what, 
we are going to reimagine a new a kind of world that everyone feels safe to live in. So this is your time, right? Uh, based on uh, Ruby uh, Bridges um, book title. So on that note, do we have other questions from the audience? Do we have questions? So I, I'm, I'm mindful about the time and um, so one question, Dr. Jeffries, I think that one is about Angela Davis. So before um, we uh, log off, and uh, so did Angela Davis get uh, particularly mistreated in criminal court system and the law courts due to her international affiliation with anti-capitalist countries and ideologies? Yes. <laughs> I mean, we go back to Angela Davis in you know late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, and it wasn't so much the you know her I mean her her, her connections to uh, international struggles of decolonization and and ab prison abolition. I mean that would sort of come a little bit later, but I mean she is treated unfairly as so many others during that sort of transition from civil rights to black power. Um, they're treated unfairly because of the activism here, right? Their connections to uh, radical black groups and radical black organizations that were fighting for freedom uh, in the United States. Uh, but but she survived. There's so many. Uh, she survived, although many others uh, did not. Although many others wind up in the criminal justice, wind up in, you know going to jail uh, if not killed and spending literally uh, a lifetime in prison. Whether you're down in the Ang Angola or New York. Uh, or California, Geronimo Pratt. So, so yes, she, yes, she was treated unfairly, uh, but she's actually one of the fortunate ones uh, that managed not to spend a lifetime in prison because of her political activism. Okay, thank you so much. So at this point, um, please, um, I think, so, um, please, some people have logged off um, because of time. So please join me again, um, you know, in thanking uh, Dr. Jeffries and also the um, former forum speakers from our community as well. Thank you again. And um, so I look forward to seeing you somewhere again. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much again and good luck, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.